Book of Job, Faithful Living in Times of Crisis, that's the name of the series. We are doing lesson number seven in this, uh, in this series. Title of tonight's lesson, The Spiritual Crisis. We'll be covering Job 38, 1 to 42, uh, 17. I think this would be a good time to review our outline in order to better understand the change that will take place in Job's experience. Our overall theme is faithful living in times of crisis. And what we've witnessed so far is Job's continued faithfulness, not his perfection, but his continued faithfulness as he undergoes two types of crisis. The first of which was faithfulness through physical crisis. Through the devil's interventions, which were permitted and limited by God, Job loses his wealth and his family, his health, his wife, his position within society, loses all of that in a very short amount of time. And he claims that this treatment is unfair, that he is innocent, that God is making a righteous man suffer, but he does not deny God, nor does he abandon his faith. Like I said, he remained faithful, not perfect. Next, we observe Job remained faithful again, but this time through a theological, the first one's a physical crisis, pain, suffering, you know, physical agony. The next crisis is a theological crisis that comes both from within himself and from other sources on the outside in the form of his three friends. Now, his inward crisis is that his theology no longer matches his reality. It's a terrible situation. The, the ideas and the framework of his spiritual thinking that he has depended on all of his life no longer match the reality and the experience that he is going through. Briefly stated, one of his key theological principles that he lived by was the common belief at the time that God blessed the righteous and punished sinners and did so in real time here on earth. And we said this was referred to as the doctrine of retribution. Job's theological dilemma or his crisis is that he knew he was a righteous man. In other words, he knew he didn't sin and he knew he was tremendously blessed by God to prove it. However, God was now punishing him as if he was a sinner. And the question that arose in his mind that he couldn't answer was, did God cause the innocent to suffer? Could this be true? Now, added to this inner crisis were the reasoned arguments of his three friends, who at other times he would have heartily agreed with. And what they were proposing was that what had happened to him was simply the working out of what the doctrine of retribution demanded. Repentance had to come before reestablishment. In other words, what they were proposing to him was he was guilty of some kind of sin or some omission. And the calamities that he had suffered were the proof that this was so. And as we read portions of their speeches, we realized how much they were trying to, they were adamant with him, you know, why don't you just repent? It's, it's as clear as day that you must have done something wrong. Look at all the things that have happened to you. So all three of his friends, plus a fourth man present, who at the end speaks, all of them make various forms of this same argument to convince Job of his guilt. 
In his responses, Job holds fast to two things that he both knows and believes. One, he is a righteous man and there is no hidden sin in his life. If anybody knows if he sinned or not, he knows and he is adamant. There is no sin in my life. There's no major thing that I have done or there's no major thing that I have left undone for which I am being punished. And then the other thing that he was sure of is that God is present and his ways are above man's ways. And this second idea only comes to him a little bit later on as he begins to kind of think through what has taken place. And so throughout this second crisis, he continues to believe and trust God, but he begins to change his mind and considers that perhaps that God has other ways. You see, maybe something, maybe something other than the law of retribution may be at work here. Maybe there's more than one spiritual law that can be true. And maybe this other law that he is not aware of is what is taking place in his life. Perhaps the way uh, he has dealt with Job is one of these different ways. Perhaps some innocent suffer now for a time to fulfill God's purpose. He comes to this particular conclusion. Perhaps he is a righteous man, but he may not understand all of God's ways a tremendous spiritual development that has taken place in his life because of his physical suffering and also because he's had to defend himself in front of his three friends. So this line of thinking prepares him to experience the greatest of his crises and that is facing God in person. So Job's spiritual crisis is facing God and that begins in chapter 38. Now, we've seen it many times. I've, you see it in movies all the time. It's a kind of a device that they use in movies, stories, where the main character you know, is talking about what he'd do if the boss or the chief or the leader or the enemy or the bully Boy, if that guy was actually in the room, I, you, know, you know what, I'd tell him, I'd show him, I wouldn't be afraid of him, you know, and what happens, you know, the guy's standing right behind him, you know, and the music, you know, is playing and <laughs> you're going, uh-oh, you know, shut up, be quiet, you know, the guy's right behind you. We see that all the time, uh, as I say, in movies. Well, this device kind of happens here in the book of Job. He has been saying, if I could just be in front of God, if, if there could just be a trial with me and God, I would tell him, I would show him, I would plead my case, you know, and he's making a big show of this. And then all of a sudden he turns around and there God is. He's face to face with his nemesis. So we've watched Job demand an audience, demand a hearing, a trial before God, so he can make his case. I'm innocent, he says. I don't deserve to suffer, and I could easily prove this. In effect, he was challenging God to appear and to defend himself in some way. Not Job defend himself. He's challenging God to appear and God defend himself in front of Job, imagine. So in chapter 38, God does appear to Job as a theophany. Uh, in this case, as a whirlwind, as a windstorm, uh, as opposed perhaps to uh, another kind of theophany, you know, like uh, for Moses, God appeared to Moses as a burning bush. Well, he appears to uh, uh, to, um, uh, to Job, not as a burning bush, he appears to him as a whirlwind or as a windstorm. Perhaps 
the whirlwind best reflected Job's life, which was left in tatters, much like what you see is left behind after a tornado. So it was apropos that God appears to him as a whirlwind. In this section, it is God's turn to speak and he makes two main speeches, each followed by Job's response of submission and repentance. The spiritual crisis that Job finds himself in is surviving God's presence as a sinner. It's one thing to survive God's presence, but to do so recognizing that you are a sinner, this is the crisis. And so God's first speech in chapter 38 is to point out Job's ignorance of inanimate creation, chapter 38. God begins by pointing out the fact that as a man, Job has no power to produce or to sustain any part of the creation. He points out Job's ignorance in general, not as an insult, but simply as a fact that needs to be recognized. In other words, I'm not saying this to you to diss you. I'm not saying this to put you down. I'm saying you're ignorant and you need to understand that you're ignorant because in understanding your ignorance, you may gain some insight. And so in his desire to debate with God, Job recognizes that he is way out of his league. And so God begins his first speech by challenging Job. We won't read all as I say, I hope you've read it, but let's at least read a couple of verses here. It says, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you instruct me. And so God goes ahead and he informs Job that he is the creative force behind the following things. He's the creative force behind the earth, verses four to seven, behind the sea, verses eight to 11, behind time itself, verses 12 to 15, behind the deep, verses 16 to 18, behind light and darkness, verses 19 and 20, behind snow and hail and fog, verses 22 to 24, behind thunderstorms, dew and ice, verses 25 to 30, behind the constellations, verses 31 to 33, as well as the clouds and the mists verses 34 to 38. Then God continues his first speech by now pointing out Job's ignorance of the animate creation. First he begins with the inanimate, you know, rocks, stars, wind, inanimate things, okay? The simple thing, God starts with the simple things. He says, here, let me show you let me show you the things that I've made and I'll just show you some of the simple stuff, you know, like the earth and the sea and time and the deep and light and snow and thunder, you know, simple stuff. Let me just show you that. And then he's going to point out Job's ignorance of the animate creation. First the inanimate, now the animate creation is listed. And of course, not a complete list, but a, a representative list of creatures that God has created, a sampling, if you wish. And so he says, God is the creator and the protector. Not just the creator, but the protector. He's the one that began these animals and he is the one that in the sense, not only protects, but sustains these animals. So he says, uh, he is the creator and protector of the lion, verse 39 and 40, the raven, verse 41, the mountain goats and hinds, 39, verses one to four, the wild donkey, five to eight, the wild ox, 39, nine to 12, the ostrich, 39, 13 to 18, the horse, 39, 19 to 25, the hawk and the eagle, verses 
26 to 30. Disparate animals, right? Birds, beasts, large beasts, small beasts, right? God has created and sustains all of these animals. And so Job responds to God, chapter 40, verses one to five. He says, then the Lord said to Job, will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Oh, oh that is so painful. <laughs> I mean, it's gentle in a sense, but how painful that is. Will the fault finder, that's you, Job, will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. In other words, okay, smart guy, now it's your turn to speak. And so Job says, then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Just in case a word slips out, I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken and I will not answer, even twice and I will add nothing more. And so God pauses in his description of the creation he has brought into existence from what is not seen, you know, Hebrews 11:3, in order to question Job directly. You who question how you've been treated, you who question God's method, who question God's intention, who question God's justice, can you answer God now that he questions you? In other words, if you're wise enough to contend, if you're smart enough to debate with me, God, if you're smart enough to debate with God about what has happened to you, surely you are wise enough to answer these basic questions that divine beings know why don't you know the answer to these questions? If you have the answer to these questions, then perhaps you might have the answer to the other questions that you purport uh, to ask. And so Job realizes how insignificant he really is in the grand scheme of things and he covers his mouth, signifying that he's already said too much. That's what it means. I, I've said too much. I'm covering my mouth because I've already spoken too much. However, he has not yet repented. He hasn't repented yet. And this leads to God's second speech and its effect in chapter 40. First, first, God begins his second speech by challenging Job to take over the running of the universe. <laughs> I remember uh, many, many, many years ago, I was a, uh, a school teacher. I taught uh, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, you know, a couple of years. And I remember a sixth grade and I had 40 odd kids in my class. I was the form teacher. But you know, those of you who are teachers, you know, there's always one kid who thinks he knows everything. He knows how things should operate. He knows what you ought to be doing. You know, anybody who's trained someone else in, in work, there's always this person that thinks they know better than you. You're the one that went to school. You're the one that has all the experience. They're the ones that have just come in to learn how to do stuff, but they know. And are you never tempted to say, wait a minute, why don't you, okay, wait, let, let me just step back here. Here, you, here, here's my coat. Here's the chalk. Here's the, uh, the eraser. You teach the class. You go ahead and, and do it if you're so smart. You fix the motor. If you know, if you're telling me how I ought to do this and that and take everything apart, whoa, 
You get in there and fix it since you're so smart. Uh, haven't you ever had the temptation to say that? Haven't you ever done it, Bob? <laughs> well, this is exactly what God does to Job. He said, you're so smart, why don't you run the universe? If you're ready to challenge my judgments and my methods, like in your own life, for example, then you should be able to do my job. So we read again a portion of this section here, beginning in chapter 40, verse six. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm and said, now gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? I mean, think about that for a moment. What, 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 what Job was doing, you know, God is telling Job what he was in effect doing. You're condemning me so that you can be right? Or do you have an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and majesty. Pour out the overflowing of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and make him low. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him and tread down the wicked where they stand, in brackets, if you're so smart, if you're so bright, if you know everything. Hide them in the dust together, bind them in the hidden place. Then I will also confess to you that your own right hand can save you. <laughs> in other words, the Lord is saying, if you can do what I do, then I, you know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll salute you if you can do what I do. And then, God uses two examples from the animal kingdom to demonstrate Job's weakness and inability to manage, let alone rule the creation. You know, he's saying, you, you want to rule? You want to take my place and rule the creation? Well, let's step back for a minute. Let's see if you can handle a small chore here, okay? And so he says, first of all, Job can't control the behemoth, hippopotamus, today's language, or the leviathan, crocodile in today's language, two very large and powerful and dangerous animals. He asks Job, can you handle these guys? And he describes how powerful these animals are. Well, if he can't dominate these creatures, what makes him think he can operate the creation and the human beings as well as the animals living in the creation? If you can't even handle a couple of animals, how are you going to handle the affairs of men? This is where Job's confession and repentance finally comes. In chapter 42, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand. In other words, I shot off my mouth I talked about stuff that I know nothing about. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I spoke, I handled ideas. I uh, presumed to say things which ought not to be said because they are way too high for me, way out of my uh, purview. Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, 
but now my eye sees you, therefore I retract. I step back. My problem, my sin, is that I stepped forward, thinking that I could engage you as an equal. And now I step back, I retract, I take it back and I repent in dust and ashes. Job's error was that he judged God's actions and intentions without having God's vantage point, among other things. He didn't have God's wisdom either, neither did he have God's knowledge or power, but he didn't have God's vantage point at the very least. Certainly a mistake with God, but also a mistake when doing this to other people. And so his repentance is in three stages. He declares what is right. And what is right is that God's knowledge and wisdom is complete. You know, when, when, when we're in the process of repenting before God or repenting before someone else, part of that repentance is not just saying, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay, can we just move on? <laughs> That's just to get stuff over with. Part of repentance is the recognition of the wrong that has been done. You know, between two people sometimes, it might be something like, I recognize that I spoke harshly to you without cause. That's what, that's what Job does. Your knowledge and your wisdom is complete. And what's left unsaid is that mine is not complete. Mine is lacking. Second stage, so first, a declaration. Second step, he acknowledges his own sin in speaking and judging things that he lacked knowledge of. In other words, he presumed to know God's ways and God's intentions. After all, he was going to correct God if he could get a meeting with him. And then the third step, he takes back what he said and he folds in the attitude that went with it. And then he repents, meaning he will respond differently in the future. He declares, he acknowledges, he takes back. Note that Job does this before there is any change in his situation. He repents because he is wrong and not simply in order to have his health back or his wealth restored. There isn't a bargain going on here. Okay, okay, I'll repent if you'll just give me back my stuff. No, he's repenting because he knows he's wrong, period. Whether he gets his wealth back or his health back or he drops dead in two minutes makes no difference. And then we have a kind of an epilogue in uh, chapter 42. After God's direct speeches to Job and Job's response, two more events take place to bring this episode in Job's life to a close. First of all, Job's friends are condemned so we read, it came about after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore take for yourself seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves and my servant Job will pray for you for I will accept him so that I may not do with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite 
went and did as the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job. So God corrects their false notion concerning the law of retribution upon which they based their judgments and their condemnations of Job. I mean, Job had been partially correct in the end, supposing that God may have reasons why the innocent suffer which were not known to man. He was kind of inching his way to you know, that, that idea, that notion. The friends claimed that they knew the mind and the manner of God and sat in his judgment seat and for this they were condemned. See, they were both wrong. I mean, the three friends were wrong and Job was wrong. But they sat in judgment. They believed that they were so right that it was impossible for them to be wrong that this gave them the license to pronounce judgment on Job. And we know that judgment belongs to God, not to, not to men. Note that Job's forgiveness from God included his participation in the process of forgiveness and reconciliation of his friends with God as well. You know, the teachings of Jesus, forgive our enemies, praying for them, we see these things working right here with Job and his friends. He has to forgive them. He has to pray for them in order for his own restoration to be complete. And that's part of our life too, isn't it? When we are at odds, when we're in conflict with someone, we also have to pray. We also have to reconcile with individuals if we ourselves are to be restored to a right place with God. And then the second thing that happens is that Job is restored in chapter 42, worth reading here. It says, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. Then all his brothers and all his sisters and all who had known him before came to him and they ate bread with him in his house and they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversities that the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him one piece of money and each a ring of gold. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning and he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand female donkeys. He had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first uh, Jemima and the second uh, Keziah and the third Karen Hapuch. Uh, uh, in all the land, no women were found so fair as Job's daughters and their father gave them inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his grandsons four generations and Job died an old man and full of days. And so the epilogue surely satisfies most people's desire you know, for a quote, a happy ending, but not everybody feels this way. Some don't like the blessings that he receives in the end because it takes away from his status as a long suffering, you know, a hero of faith persona. You know, like Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle suffered, suffered, and he suffered, and there was no, quote, happy ending. He went to the executioner, boom. He didn't get another 40 years to keep preaching the gospel and so on and so forth. Realize, however, that this was not done as a reward. Since Job was perhaps not guilty of losing faith, but was guilty of presuming on God and challenging his ways, no reward was actually due to him for his failing in this way. No, the restoration was more an indication that the trial in his life was over. And since he had learned what God had revealed to him about it, it was time to return to normal life. And this demonstrated God's continued attention to his servants before, during, and after the crisis in their lives. Doesn't that happen to us many times? We have a crisis in our life. We draw closer to God. We, we pray to him. Uh, our prayers become so 
intentional, uh, so deep uh, because we're suffering, uh, whatever we're suffering, and then eventually there's a break, our health improves or the situation gets better or we get an answer or something, something or other. You know, and then all of a sudden that intensity is, 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 is gone. It's like we go back, you know, back to the same old, same old. And, and, and I think the thing we see here is that uh, God is with us during the normal times. He's with us in the crisis moment, but he remains with us after the crisis, after things come back to normal, he is still there. He is still requiring our input, our attention, our adoration. Remember, uh, Job is called upon to still have faith because even though he has survived the crisis of being in the presence of God, the Lord still hasn't revealed to Job the reason for all of his suffering. He still doesn't know. You know, the devil's challenge that Job would you know, lose his face if he lost his family and material wealth. Job doesn't know this. This is not revealed to him. So part of Job's repentance, despite the renewal of family and wealth and health and honor, is that he must still trust God and live each day by faith. He was living each day by faith when he was in the crisis. The lesson of the crisis is that he must live each day by faith. Your life is not lived based on wisdom and understanding. Your life is lived by faith. Whether you're in crisis or not in crisis, your life is always lived on the basis of, of faith. Okay, next week uh, we're going to come up with some lessons from uh, Job. Um, I want you to uh, have a, uh, a bit of an assignment. Even those of you who are watching online and maybe those of you who are watching you know, on a video a little bit later on, I want you to consider all the things that we've talked about in the last several weeks, and I want you um, to come up with a lesson. In other words, what is a lesson that you have learned from this study? Okay? I, I'm not saying we're going to have time to go through the whole audience. All right? I want you to do it as an, a spiritual exercise based on the study that we've had. And I will bring some of the lessons that I think uh, come from our study of, of Job. And then the following week we have a special lesson where we're going to consider um, various types of mourning, if you wish. Uh, you know, biblical mourning versus the mourning that goes on in the world uh, when uh, people go through hardship. Okay, that's our lesson for tonight. Thank you for your attention.